Well, good morning. We're, we've got a, a wonderful opportunity today to speak with a veteran of the 1st Division uh, who had uh, experience on the Mexican border and also with the 1st Division when it was fighting in France during World War I. And we're privileged to be able to uh, speak with uh, Arlie Oppenheim about his experiences as a soldier during 70 years ago, nearly 75 years ago. Arlie, I wondered if we could begin, if you could say, tell us a little biographical information about yourself. Well, I was born in Statenville, Georgia. Family of sharecroppers. I was sent to Galveston, Texas to the 28th United States Infantry. I served with that organization until 1920, the 10th day of September, five and a half years. In August, we went to Dallas, Texas, and we trained to put on an army tournament at the Dallas State Fair. In October, it came due, and we started to put on the show. One night we came off after the show and we rushed to the Mexican border. There had been a raid at Ojo de Agua and they killed 15 Americans in the cavalry, 3rd Cavalry. Our first job was to clean up the mess, which was awful because we had 15 dead Americans and we had around 100 dead Mexican horses that we had to dispose of. We stayed on the Mexican border until the war was declared, April the 6th, 1917. When the war was declared, we were assembled in Mission, Texas. The regiment was reinforced from 60 men to the company to 250 men to the company, given us 3,000 men per regiment. And we left there in May and went to New York. On the 14th day of June, we sailed to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And there assembled the convoy, first convoy to go to France. We had the Tenedores, the Pastores, and the Decob, transports three. We had the Seattle battle wagon for an escort with four destroyers. And we hit out for France. First American convoy. We landed at Saint Nazaire. Two days out, we had a submarine attack. The torpedo was fired from the middle of the convoy. Fortunately, it missed everything but the tow cable for a target. It hit the tow cable and exploded and cut the tow cable. We proceeded on to Saint Nazaire. But we went into training with the French. And we trained with the Scotch. And we studied their tactics. We didn't like the way that the European armies done battle. Three, four, or five weeks of bombardment and then a charge. We didn't make any move until the 28th day of May of 1918. On the night of the 27th, the was blown assembly, we were told we had 10 minutes. Combat equipment and two days rations, two bandoliers of ammunition, about 60 rounds to a bandolier. That gave us 220 rounds of rifle ammunition. 
the ones who was fortunate enough to carry 45s through three extra clips. That was 24 rounds. That gave us 40 rounds altogether for the 45. And we moved up during the night to Cantini, the opening of the American campaign. On the morning of May the 28th, the sun came up about four o'clock. We didn't move out until 6.45. 6.45, we attacked the city of Cantini and captured it without any difficulty. My squad was on the extreme left flank. We were supposed to hold a line beyond the town, which we did. I was digging in with one of the road trench shovels, making a hole, throwing the dirt up to the front. My rifle was laying in the back. A German charged out of the wheat, which was waist high, and you couldn't see until he was right on top of you. And the only thing I could do was grab my gun and stick the butt on the ground and let the German run into it, which he did. It hit him just below the forks of the breastbone, and it stuck so deep that I had to fire a shot to get my bayonet loose to go and dig my hole, which we completed. And we built new trenches. We were lucky. 20 minutes after we made the attack, we got a counterattack. And from then until June 1, we had 17 of them, which we withstood without much trouble. The Germans learned that they couldn't put the fear of God in the hearts of the American swine, as they named us, because we put the fear of God in the American army into the German army with the defense that we put up at Cantini, which was the beginning of the American combat. And ladies and gentlemen, we made four other attacks against the German army from May 28th until November 11th. We moved back to a town and uh, got new equipment got cleaned up, seen a big trench of bayonets, and took out after the German army. Went up the Moselle Valley from Alsace Lorraine into Koblenz, Germany. We arrived in Koblenz, Germany on the 11th of December, and we were sent up to a, to a place called Storzenfeld Castle which was a German fortress to the right of Koblenz. There we spent the night. During the night, we had a sleet storm. And due to the castle's construction, we were not allowed to wear hobnail shoes inside. We had to take our shoes off and put on felt carpets and left our shoes on the doorsteps. The next morning, our shoes were filled with sleet. And we had to beat our shoes with the butts of our rifles so we could get them number enough to put on. We went back into Koblenz, the 12th, and crossed the Rhine River, and went up to a town called Montebauer, where Division headquarters was established. The regiments were spread out over the American zone, which we controlled 
until 1919. He came home September of 1919. We landed in New York the fourth day of September. We was taken out to Camp Merritt. And there we were told that the regular army would not be discharged. The division was going to parade in New York and Washington. I found out I could re-enlist for one year and get a regular army date of discharge, which I did. I got a 30-day furlough, and I didn't make the parades in New York and Washington because I was getting married. I have here. A Distinguished Service Cross, Mexican Border Service Medal, and my Victory Medal. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how um, you won your Distinguished Service Cross? Saving Senator Sam Irwin, in July of 1918. And we were attacking a pillbox, and we didn't know what we were up against. Sam got hit in the hip by a piece of shrapnel. I signaled for him to move up. He didn't move up. I went back to see what was wrong, and he was down. I pulled him into a shell hole, tore off his shirt tail, put in a trigger guard, stuck the bayonet in the ground to signal to the medical corps that there was a wounded soldier in that shell hole. Next day, I was wounded and blowed up and sent to the hospital. Two days later, I met Sam again in the hospital in Dijon, and we talked. Sam was sent home. I was lingering around the hospitals trying to get fixed up. I was finally sent down to base 22 at Beaudesert. There they worked on me. And Dr. Miller told me she was going to send me home. This four year which I'm entitled to wear, was one at Cantini. And in 1920, 1991, 92, I asked a soldier at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, what that was for, part of the uniform. I said, is that all you know about it? He said, yes, sir. And I told him the story of the Voyager and how it was won and why. He said, mister, you have told me something that nobody else bothers to tell me. But I'm going to tell the rest of these soldiers what that means to you. Well, I said, it does mean to me. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. You're a very good interview. Thank you. Uh, you did a very good interview. Thank you. We are here in Salt Lake City, and it's the 11th of July in 1996. And we're speaking today with Frank Rose, a veteran of both the 1st Division from World War I and the 28th Infantry Regiment. Yeah, I was graduated from high school in, in Lebanon, Oregon, and uh, in June, and then in July, I joined the services, and my father didn't object to it at all. 
And this was in uh, 1917? Yeah, and I went to Ohio. College or Oregon State, you know. But we've got you signed up for the Army, and I presume this was in Oregon where you signed up? Yeah. And where, did they, where did they ship yeah, you out to? I was, where did you go? and then when the war, I was, I was going to Oregon State then, and then they called me from the serv uh, college to the service, and then, then I finished up after the war. But, but once now we once you signed up in July of 1917 yeah, in Oregon was, where, where did they send you where did you where did you go first after? well I went down to Mexico or down under to the border down there Leo Pancho was making raids across the border and he didn't come to California he was mostly in Texas but they we were along there at the border but we couldn't go across it but then then that was the reason there, and then the War One came, and I was well, already what, in the service. Now, what unit were you in down on the border? It was the Oregon National Guard. Yes. Were you cavalry or infantry? Were you in the cavalry or the infantry? Uh, infantry. Infantry. It wasn't, I, I, I don't think the Oregon Guard had a cavalry. Right. No, I'm not sure. Uh, that was when. No, I know that. That's when General Pershing was asked to form up the regiments to form a division to go to France, and I suspect at that time uh, you ended up in the first division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did go over there, and uh, we landed in San Lozelle down the south of France. That was the first American troops that had landed there. There. Do you remember where you shipped out from? Where? Out of New York. Out of New York. Yeah. I was selected to be in the runners section. Oh, okay. There. And that's where I served all the rest of the war. So you were at the regimental and headquarters. Except when I was in the hospital, right. too. But I I liked that because you delivered messages that came from the front up there. And you knew what was going on. You had to memorize it, most of that, because so if you got caught, you would eat the other one and, and, and swallow it all. And, but and we, we did that way. And we got, to, that's the way I got up there on that, on that runner section and I stayed there for the whole war, except when I was in hospitals. And he sent me up to, uh, to deliver a mail to, uh, mail, uh, get a message to A Company in, and uh, they hadn't got their signals uh, to take up, up there in the front. Mm -hmm. And I and a, a daylight came, and the uh, German sharpshooters were out there, and I wasn't about to get hit that way, so I laid down right behind the bunker, and pretty soon that rolling barrage started, which is the beginning of the uh, Cantigny War. Yes, and I never forget that one. And the French and the British and the Americans all could combine their artillery to uh, lay down that current uh, moving barrage. You could just follow along behind it a hundred feet, and and it was just rosing and along till we got to where the Germans were, and it'd be it would over hell down. And, they got up and they had their hands up, those that didn't get hit. And that was the easy part of it, but pretty soon when he got up into Cantigny and the Germans had given in there too, and then they set in with artillery, with their a bombardment behind us, and the people couldn't, <coughs> or the fellows in there couldn't get food, they couldn't get water, and but they thought they'd starve us out and you'd take it back again, see. But they tried that and they, they didn't quite make it, but it was a tough one. I know I was a message carrier and I could get through there, sneak through that barrage 
And I filmed the canteens with, and I got the next ones and carried them up. And when I had a message up there to one of those captains in the front there, out ahead of the uh, canteen, he about a hundred yards again. Sure. It's just an open field there. Yes. And those guys in the trenches, I, when I delivered to some of those to the to those captain the messages, they I said, What are they're urinating urinating in tin cans? I said, What are you gonna do with that? They said we're gonna drink it when it gets cool. There the Germans are keeping the, the everything out, but they did finally give in and and we did get food up there real quick and our um, ammunition and water too. And did you ever it. did you ever carry a message up to Captain Hubner in the second battalion? Yes, I carried to all of those up there. Right. I, and, and even the, the captains, yeah, sure. All of them I did it. I did it in, in, in those. What, what did you think of the German soldier as a as a fighter? Well, they were good, and they had good equipment, too, they did. We had, the, I know once, before I just got to carrying that, I was carrying ammunition to a, a machine gun up in front. We just had two machine guns up there to, in that field, uh, uh, burning that whole thing. Where was the cemetery in relation uh, to where you were? The cemetery was back of Was back of you. Yeah, a, a church there. I right. can tell you something about that too. Okay. But anyway, uh, uh, I told a fellow that we I had lost two of his, two men loaded with the machine guns getting up here in the daylight. I said, "How can't we can't we wait till dark?" And he thought well. He said, "Yes, I think I have enough." I asked him yeah, no. and and uh, so he did, and and then while I was waiting there, I was selected to go for a runner. So I didn't carry any more ammunition. You were going to tell me about the church and canteen. Oh, yeah. You know, I think those early churches had secret tunnels. They did, and that that one did. And and I was with some those French flamethrowers and I uh, cleaning out the bunkers of uh, uh, the Germans <coughs> and they threw in there and uh, a couple of, I'd have called uh, Cooper Ralph if they didn't come out they had threw in uh, some uh, liquid fire and I'd throw in a hand grenade and we'd go on to the next one and but this one I was carrying messages later then. In that, and uh, four or five days later, and I, there's a, a, a about four feet wide, just a round head, hole down there in the ground, and it sloped back toward that church, and it had wire around it, and a steel post. And I always wondered why, when I was carrying messages, what there was that, and I stopped one night and listened. It has been five or six days since the war, uh, since we had take over, mm -hmm. and I heard a sound down in there, and and I yeah I knew it was Germans in that there because I've been cleaning up the, the bunkers, but this one we missed, and I yelled down in there, Kumaraus, and one did come out, and they prayed for me not to kill him. I didn't we were going to anyway, and then. I told him to go back down in there, and I'd come back and get after I delivered this message, and and then to give him. And so I did, and they sent me back with another man, and that other man wouldn't go down in there. I went down there alone, and I had told him I had to have a candle, and I went down there alone, and lit that candle. And there's those four, five, six Germans, and the captain was sick. Uh, we got hit, though, and he was in a bunker up there. And, and I told them, if best I could in English, 
that the war was over for them, and I, I would take them prisoner. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, I know you speak some French, but did you speak any German at all? Yeah. I, I did learn German, sure, when I was up there in German. I, I learned to speak that, too. Did one of, I couldn't do it right there. Did one but of those anyway, German, go ahead. This is the interesting part of it. That, that, that fellow went by and me, and he was going on up there, through that coal up there like I did. There's a plank in there that's cleaved in. And we got a, a kind of a saw, a mesh, so, so we could take out that, uh, uh, that captain up there. He, but this fellow was walking by me, getting ready, and he, he was a bugler, and he had a bugle over his shoulder. And I have that bugle. Is this the bugle? That's the bugle. <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> and I thought, well, he wouldn't be using a bugle anymore. And I took that off his shoulder, and that's it. That's a marvelous piece. That is it. Did he tell you to take it, or you, did you just take I it? Just, he didn't tell me not to, but he <laughs> was glad enough to, get, glad enough to get taken without being injured or hurt. Yes. And, and we, I didn't hurt any of them. They, they just gave in all of them. Did any of them speak? And I was the only one down there, and, but I was enough that they marched out. And did you that's have, the bugle that was on his shoulder. Did you have a pistol or a rifle? I had a pistol. And I and that captain had a pistol. And so that other fellow wouldn't come down. I got that captain's pistol, a Luger, and all polished and shined up. It was beautiful and, and his holster was polished and, and I got that, but, and I had that, I thought I was going to have a nice pistol, but that fella up, up there wouldn't come down. He told the major that I had a pistol, but I took off of that, and the major told me that uh, this is enemy ordinance and you're supposed to turn it in. Well, and I went out where I hid it and gave it to him. Is there anything else you remember about that battle that you'd like to tell us about Canton? Yes, there is. It was just kind of sad thing. Lieutenant Colonel Eli. Yes. He said to me, he said, you and me, we're going to be in this together. And that was just the beginning of that drive following that, that barrage into Canton. Yes. And I was sent out there, I like said, to get the uh, B Company's auxiliary, but the daylight came and I couldn't get out, get off the ground on account of those snipers. And I laid there till that barrage came. And I followed it through, cleared it up to Camp Tatney and through Camp Tatney, and, and those two French flamethrowers. I had practiced that before. I knew they were coming. Oh, yes. I knew they were the only two Frenchmen, I think, because I knew they were there. We had a practice, but they weren't there. I was carrying brush for, their, for them. And so I fell in with them, and I yelled out on those bunkers, and, and if they didn't come out, like, they'd give them a some squirt of uh, liquid fire, and I'd throw in a hand grenade, and we'd go on to the next ones, and, and that's the way that we got along with those French flamethrowers, and that's that picture of one of those. <coughs> was in the New York Times, I think it was, Paris edition. And I saw that there in the next, uh, next year up there in the Army of Occupation. I showed that picture to him. It was a half a page on slick paper. And I had that hand grenade and those air fella, air, those flamethrowers or something in down in a bunker. And I had that hand grenade up there, and they took that, and I, I saw it up there, and I showed that to some of the fellas. Oh, they looked at that, 
is that we were so used to it, we didn't, and I never kept it. We, they just looked at it, and they was kept on playing cards. And I didn't keep it either, and so I wish I had that one. We're, uh, we're going to do a, a video interview with Private Max Ottenfeld of the 18th Infantry today, headquarters company of the 18th Infantry, and not from Vietnam, and not from World War II, but from the Great War, World War I. And I want to just start by asking uh, Private Ottenfeld to remember a little bit about his, his uh, hometown and home life just before he signed up uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Army and tell us a little bit about how he got into the 1st Division. Well, when I, at that time, we lived in Madison, Wisconsin. I was just going into my sophomore year in high school. The Mexican War was brewing at that time, and uh, I thought I wanted to go into the Mexican War. We, had a, we did have a home guard outfit in Madison, and we, used, we had uniforms, and we drilled once a week. I wanted to, when the troops left for Mexico or down to the border, that's as far as the National Guard got. See, they only used the regular army in Mexico going out of the country. My mother objected very strongly because I was only about 15 and a half years old. And she couldn't afford to lose a breadwinner because <laughs> we had about four or five others to eat. Well, anyway, I couldn't go. Finally, I decided that I was going to go. Of course, this was some time later. I, two of my friends, older fellows than I was, that were working, were going to enlist. So I decided that I would go. Well, I went home because it was noontime, and I went home to get something to eat. And while I was eating, my mother says, what seems to be wrong with you? You're not, you're not acting right. Well, I says, so, sooner or later, you're going to find out. I says, well, I just enlisted, and I'm supposed to go down to the railway station, and I'm going to be with others, and we're going to Chicago, where they're going to do something with us. And I left, and while I, was while I was at the depot waiting for the train, my father showed up, see? And I guess my mother was uh, a little too excited to come down. Well, anyway, I left then. And then from there, in a short time, we headed for the west Co uh, east coast, and we got down to Camp Merritt, and then I got a, a boat ride on the largest ship afloat, the Leviathan, the fatherland, they called it. We changed it to the Leviathan. And I made the trip over there to England. And we landed at Liverpool. And, but finally, I don't know it was because I had, was previous service, I was detailed to go to France. And I was sent to a town in France to go to signal school. And that's where I, I went. I forget whether I spent about three months or so. But had I not gone to signal school and gone, you know, to the first division, I would have been in all that first stuff, see? Mm -hmm. 
and I would have made cantini when when where they were at cantini when they were at Soissons. I was in see like during May June, mm -hmm. and finally in July, we finished our course, and then I was sent to the 18th Infantry. In those days, uh, when when we were studying to be signalmen, the important thing really was wireless. So we had two wireless. We had wireless through the air, the old Marconi, and we had the French system, telegraphy sans fait, underground. Well, we had to cut out wireless. And still, too many guys were getting knocked off. For the simple reason that the Germans could pick that up with their equipment, underground or through the air. Mm -hmm. So after we lost a sufficient number of men, somebody decided that they would use telephones. So that's where the telephone came in, because they couldn't detect the telephone. You've told me uh, some marvelous stories about, about the Argonne. Uh, could you re relate the story about when you were wounded in your knapsack? Oh, well, that came, that came on the attack, you know. Oh, the, well, they fought the night, the night before. Incidentally, the night before we went over was my 19th birthday, October the 3rd. And I, they asked, oh, and we got word that they were bringing up food, that they were sending up a field kitchen. And they asked for volunteers to go back and bring the, they couldn't come up, you know, where we were, see, but they were back quite a ways. So I volunteered because I, I made that route, you know, up and back, the artillery was stationed back there. And, and most of the stuff was either between the different outfits or, when necessary, the artillery. Well, anyway, I had gone back, and uh, this kitchen, oh, they were loaded with pork and beans, pork and sow belly, not the sow belly and beans, rather. And I don't know whether they had like a ketchup in them, you know, had them doped up. Well, anyway, we had. I, there were three of us, if I remember correctly. Well, two of the guys got beans, but while we were there, and I hadn't eaten for five days, and we hadn't had water for longer than that, and I'm telling you, it was played out, and I wasn't, didn't get any chance to get any sleep. I don't know how I stayed awake. We got back to our place, when we got there, there was the rest of the headquarters company. They had moved in then. And, well, we carried that stuff in there. But before I left that kitchen, I filled up my mess kit with these beans and salt belly. Figuring there may be a time when I might consider this a delicacy, which I put in there. Well, we got back there, and I met some of my friends, and one of the fellows had already dug a hole, and I don't know, they must have brought up some of that sheet metal, and he had a cover there. And when I got back and he saw me, he says he had room, you know, for me to sleep with him there. So I did. I got, went in there, and that was the first sleep that I had, I don't know how many days. Well, you wouldn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Nobody will believe me. But shelling started. And I don't know whether I came to. And all my troops we're gone. And I wonder, what the hell? Where, 
my buddy. So I said, boy, I better get moving. So then I started out and I figured, well, they wouldn't be going back, they'd be going forward. So I started out and I started walking and boy, it was, they were really laying them down and the big ones. And some of them would burst, you know, whole. And I, as I went along, one of the big ones came and really blew a hole and I in the hole. And I don't know how long I lay there. Finally, I came, I must have come to, and I pulled myself out of this hole, out of this shell hole. And as I see over the shell hole, I see troops marching, going the same way I would have gone. And sure enough, it was, I asked who they were. They were the 26th Infantry, you know, part of the 1st Division. And the captain, and the, he had a guy with him. And they couldn't figure what happened. I told him, I, I don't know, and I guess it had been raining, and I got up, and I guess I was pretty muddy. And so we, we talked, and I said, well, I better, uh, where, where is the 18th Infantry? I says, if I don't get back to her, I says, I'm going to get in trouble. And he says, yeah, well, they're, I have no idea where they are, but if they're up there somewhere, he says, uh, you, uh, you, you, you probably can't make it there. Well, I says, I says uh, well, I'm a signal man. I says, Christ, I'm supposed to be an important guy there. And I says, I've been up here in advance taking care of the signal work. He says, you're what? I says, I'm a signal man. He says, what, what part of it? I says, I'm a telephone, telephone man, lineman. You, you're a lineman? He says, you're not going anywhere. He says, you're falling in with us. He says, we lost our signal man and we'll be needing a, help. Well, I said, boy, if I get in trouble, he says, I'll take care of that. And I said, will you give me a note or something when we're through here? And he says, yes. And I stayed with him till they carried me off the battlefield. Yes, uh, it was pretty hot. And as I say, uh, the shells were falling in the midst of our men, our own shells. And the uh, we had no communication there at where I was at there. And there were corps men that had come up and was a doctor. And all of a sudden, they, they started bringing the men where the Germans had been shelling. They dug out like on the side of a hill and the place that you could go and take uh, cover. And they were bringing some of those people over there that were wounded. And they brought one man over who had been hit in the neck. And it made a hole in his juggler vein. And they brought him over there and set him down on the ground and it propped him up. I couldn't do anything for him. And I saw the medics out there. And I rushed out there, and I, doctor, I says, I got a man here, very serious. I says, he's bleeding very bad. And I said, there's an opening in his throat. So he came over with me, and when he got over, he looked. He says, there's nothing, nothing that we could do for him. He says, he, he'll be, it'll only be a moment or so. All his blood will be gone, and that'll be it. Well, I s stay there with that man, and I, he finally took his last breath. And I've never forgotten that. That has been a thing that has lost a lot of sleep for me, still does, after all these years. Well, anyway, after he expired, I went into this opening spot, 
And as I'm going into this opening spot, there's a shell burst. Of course, naturally, I heard it. <laughs> and whether I ducked or not, I don't know, but I must have done something. And all of a sudden, I felt a thump on my back. Pretty good thump. And, God, I, and I figured it was a piece of shrapnel. And lo and behold, some of the men there, and the aides come running over to me, grabbing, grab me, figuring that I was bleeding. Well, when they found out, and when I knew what it was, it was the first lap we had had in a long, long time. Inside of that pack, I still had that untouched prior to the thump of the baked beans and that so-called pork, pork and beans, with the ketchup in it. It went, hit me so hard that it went through on the pack, through this heavy aluminum mess kit. And then, of course, the beans in there. I got a good thump. I had a bruise, but uh, didn't cut. But I had blood coming. The juice from the baked beans were running down my back. And, and as I say, everybody thought I had gotten a bad wound and were going to do something. But when I told them what I had there, boy, I thought, it, I thought they were going to retire. <laughs> it, and to me, it got funny. It got funny. It could have been pretty darn serious, but I had, had something that would uh, kind of cheer them up. Uh, I don't know how long I was with the 26th. That was Teddy Roosevelt, Jr.'s. He was colonel mm -hmm. of the regiment. And I don't know how far I went, whether I passed out or I was that bad, you know, with, with shell shock or the gas. And anyway, I'm laying, I'm laying on, the, on the ground there, and it was kind of chilly. It was October. It was October the 12th. One place they said 11th, and I figured maybe they meant the night of the 11th, uh, because when I came to, it was dark, and I heard somebody talking. And I, could, I spoke up, tried to speak, my throat was awful bad, and I couldn't see. And I asked, uh, is there somebody over there near me? And the guy answered, yes. I said, what, what am I doing here? Well, he says, you're waiting to be evacuated to a hospital. I said, how did I get here? I says, I don't remember anything getting here. He said, they brought you in on the back of a signal car mule. They used, they'd have two uh, rolls, one on each side, you know, over their back like a saddle. And he said, you, you came in on, over the back between those rolls. They had you on there. Then they brought you over and laid you on the ground. Oh, I said, they laid me, and I said, they, they must have dropped me on the ground because I said, that's when I must have come to. So I lay there until they came with a stretcher. And then the, the uh, ambulance pulled in, this one I'm talking about, horse drawn, and I was put in there, and then I was taken to an evacuation hospital. So they took some of us that were recuperating. This was in a month, within a month. And they put us out in tents. Well, they put us out in tents, and then we got word that we were going to be sent to a replacement camp and sent to some outfit. Well, geez, I didn't want that. And I squawked about it. Well, they, they can't send me back to my own outfit. The order is that you go to a replacement camp 
and they send you where they need you. Well, that morning, I went for some breakfast, and then I had a thing there that blew me off. I had gotten hold of a 45, brand new. Some guys had got into a box car where they had ammunition and guns and stuff, and they got a crate of 45s. And I got one from one of the fellas. I met at the hospital, I met a fellow from Madison, Wisconsin. And his father was a big shot politician. And incidentally, I had used to go out with his sister, <laughs> which made it all worse. And I, I went to eat, and so did he. When I come back, I decided I'm going to go AWL. Well, I left. I started out and I started to walk. This was the early morning of November the 11th which incidentally turned out to be Armistice Day. Well, I'm trying to get away, from, you know, from the place, and I'm walking down a lonely road, and I saw what looked like a little store, and I thought, maybe I can bump some. I didn't have any money, so I thought I'd go by to this store. Well, I got by there, and it was closed. Well, I turned around to walk, and I hear horns blowing. And I go, oh, oh, they're coming after me to get me, you know, either do something with me or get me to go to that camp, you know. And as I'm, I just kept walking, and all of a sudden this, something pulls up close to me, and I turn around, and it's a jeep with four French soldiers in there. And they're shouting to me, Finny Laguerre, Finny Laguerre. Well, I know what, I knew some French by then, and I thanked them. Didn't, didn't mean anything to me. I was hungry. I didn't have any money. Well, besides, the store wasn't open. So I just made the best of it. And I started to walk again. I was walked, I don't know how many days, finally, trucks were coming back towards my way. And I st finally got somebody to stop. And then I asked, by any chance, where were you? And they looked at me. Well, I said, I'm trying to find my outfit. I says, I'm with the, First Infantry Division. And, and I said, I just got out of the hospital, and I said, I'm on my way to find them. He said, we just came back. He said, uh, we left them up in the uh, uh, Luxembourg City, Luxembourg. But they weren't going to be there. They were supposed to pull out the next day. Well, then I got a break. There were other transports going up. and. Some might go three, four miles. I'd get a ride for three, four miles. Then he'd pull in, you know, somewhere on the way where there were troops. Then another one come along. <clears throat> and I'd be hiking in the meantime. I finally got to Luxembourg City, and, but they naturally weren't there. So then I had to get to a place called Gravenmacher, Luxembourg, which was right on the Moselle River. And I knew then that I had to catch up with them because the armistice, a lot of people called it, the war was over. Well, it wasn't over. And we couldn't go into Germany then. We had a truce that was an armistice. And we were supposed to stay on the one side of the Moselle River until December the 1st. Max, I think we'll finish up by asking you to remember just a little bit about the formation of the Society of the First Division there in Germany and uh, perhaps a little bit about the circus and then uh, we can go on from there. Well, I was in the hospital when they uh, 
started it. Well, I don't know whether <clears throat> most of the people don't know that the First Division Society originally was for officers. Then, of course, some of the uh, first sergeants or uh, master sergeants, the uh, well, we call them the company clerks, mm -hmm. the guys that had the special braid on, on their hat, you mm -hmm. know. They were like uh, officers going to a training school, you know. Well, they, some of them were in the, maybe the doctors or something. Well, any, then it was opened up. We got, when, then we were, as we were in Germany, they decided to have a reunion. The men, we still were not in the society, in reality, see. They had a banquet. Those days, banquets cost money, the same as they do now. And there were very few, from my knowledge, of the enlisted men unless they got money from home, was able to afford to buy a ticket to the reunion, that is, to the dinner. So I did not attend. I knew that the, the reunion was on. I was part of the reunion, but I did not go to the banquet until after we came home, then they organized branches. And we had a branch in Chicago. Well, anyway, we, org we organized and we came out here to Cantini Farm. McCormick, we knew that, you know, McCormick was a colonel. That is, he got the, became a colonel I think after he left France. I think that's right. He was a major when he commanded his Well, battalion. he was a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. He got a, he was made a lieutenant colonel as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And then at uh, at Cantini. You know, he wasn't there very long. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to have been ill. Mm -hmm. And uh, they claimed that he uh, was directing the sixth field from his bed. Which uh, may be true. You know, Max, I, uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time, and I know you're getting a little tired, so we'll, we'll wrap this up now. Uh, I very much appreciate you reaching deep back into those memories of 70 and 75 years ago and sharing those with us. I, I might just say for the record that Max continues to serve as the chaplain of the local uh, Cantini chapter of the Society of the First Division after all these years. And he's still very active in American Legion and other uh, veterans' activities throughout the city of Chicago. Well, I'm, don't forget, I'm the commander of the 1st Division Cantini Post now. And I'm one of your members. And, and I, you're one of my <laughs> prize members. <laughs> well, this has been a, been a wonderful opportunity to, to remember those events of so yeah. long ago, and I know the, there'll be many many veterans and many soldiers and many other visitors, just citizens who will have no knowledge of World War I that will learn something by being able to watch your tape and, and share your experiences uh, because of this interview.